Amen. All right, so John chapter number 10 here this morning. We're continuing on with a series of sermons on uh, Old Testament quotes in the Gospels. And so th- what's great about this series is you get a ton of different doctrines from this uh, series. And so look down at what the Bible has to say there in verse number 32, or verse number 34 rather. The Bible says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said... Ye are gods. And so that's what we're going to talk about here this morning, that quote right there in the scripture where it says, ye are gods. Now, what does that mean? Is the Bible saying, is God saying that all of us are God? Because there are those out there that would teach that kind of a false doctrine. In fact, out souling, I have even ran into people that have said, well, we are all God. I mean, we all make up God and so forth. And then you've got the other side where there are... You know, people who are atheists and so forth that don't believe the Bible that will try to take this quote to say that this is a contradiction in the Bible because after all, the Bible says there is only one God, but then it also says ye are gods. So what is it talking about when it says ye are gods? When it says it is written ye are gods, what does that quote mean? Well, take your Bibles. First off, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Look at what the Bible has to say there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8, and look at verse number 4. Look at what the Bible has to say. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Just turn to the right in your Bible. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 8 and look down at verse number 4 and look what the Bible says there. And the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 8 verse number 4. It says, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. So what's the Bible saying about that idol? That idol is nothing, right? It cannot hear, it cannot speak, it cannot act. That idol is not a living thing. That idol itself is not a god. But what you do see in the scripture is that there are demons and devils that impersonate gods. That's why the Bible tells us if, if even if an angel comes unto you preaching another gospel, it says, let him be accursed. And men would do well to listen to the word of God because there, that is in fact how some false religions have started and began. I mean, we could look at Mormonism and how is it that Mormonism began. Well, there was an angel that appeared under Joseph Smith. The same thing with Islam. That's that, that is how Islam started. The same thing with other religions. And so we have to compare things to the Word of God. Now look at what it goes on to say there. The Bible says, and there is none other, at the end of verse 4, at, and that there is none other God but what? But one, so when it comes to talking about the supreme being, right? That what we actually think of as God, what does the Bible say? What is the doctrine that the Bible teaches? There is only one. So there are not many gods out there. And by the way, all these false gods of the world, they're not all the same God. And all the, re- the religions of the world are not exactly the same because basically there are two religions out there in the world. Because what do you have? You have biblical Christianity that teaches salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not of the works that you do. And then if you look at every other religion out there, it doesn't matter whether it's Judaism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. They all teach a works-based salvation, that you have to be a good person, you have to do good works, you have to go to church, you have to do all this stuff in order to go to heaven. So if they teach something contrary to biblical Christianity, then they are not the same, and the God of those two things are not the same. So according to the Bible, there is only one God. Now look at what it goes on to say there, verse number five. Look at what it goes on to say. For though there be that are called, what's that? Gods, the Bible says, whether in heaven and notice this, or where? Or in earth, as there be gods many, and what? 
enlords many. Now, the word God in the Scripture is a word that can also be used for a human being in this context because you could look at somebody and they, you could call that man your ruler. Today, we wouldn't use that term. What would we use today in our modern v- vernacular? We'd say, that guy's my boss. Right? That's what we would call him. But back in the time of the Bible, they would often use the term Lord. That they would look at somebody who was their boss or somebody who was over them, and they would call him what? Lord. Don't we see that with Sarah? How that Sarah looks at Abram and calls Abram Lord. In fact, take your Bibles, let me show that to you. Go ahead and go to 1 Peter chapter number 3, and look at what the Bible says there. 1 Peter chapter number 3. And look down at verse number 6, 1 Peter chapter number 3, and look at verse number 6 and see what the Bible has to say there. 1 Peter chapter number 3, and look down at verse number 6, 1 Peter chapter number 3, and verse number 6, and the Bible says right there, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him what? Lord. Lord. Why is she calling him Lord? Because he has rule over her. Because he has authority over her. Now, in our day and age, in our modern vernacular, we don't use that term for one another, do we, too much? I mean, unless you happen to be joking with somebody. But in our modern vernacular, you don't go to your boss and say, yes, Lord, do you? But back in Bible times, that was a term that they would use. So when it is written in the scriptures, it says, ye are gods. That is the sense in which it is using it, that they can be bosses or rulers or lords in that context. It is not saying that they are God Almighty. That is not what it is saying about that. Take your Bibles, go to Psalms chapter number 82. You know what, before you go there, go to Exodus chapter number 22. And look at what the Bible says there. Exodus chapter number 22. And look down at what the Bible has to say in verse number 28. Exodus chapter number 22 and verse number 28. That's why you see this phrase in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter number 22 and verse number 28. And the Bible says there, Thou shalt not revile the gods, gnosis, nor curse who? The ruler of thy people. So who is being called a god here in the Old Testament? It's the ruler of thy people is who that is talking about. It's not talking about false gods because aren't we supposed to revile false gods? Shouldn't we hate false gods? I mean, shouldn't we hate false religion? And absolutely we ought to because God hates those things. But what it's saying is thou shalt not revile the rulers of your society that you shouldn't just go against government. Remember, we ought to have a government. Now, our government goes beyond its authority, doesn't it? Our government goes way beyond what God has given to them. But we don't want to be a society that is just an anarchy, do we? We need to have a society that is based upon morals and laws. And if a society is based upon laws, there must be somebody to enforce that law. And that is the purpose of the government, that that is their God-given place, is to enforce the laws that God has laid out in His Word. Yo, who is it that is to enforce the law of, thou shalt not steal? That's a government. I mean, do I get to just take that into my own hands, into my own power, and be a vigilante out there running around with a cape and a mask on and enforce the laws of the land? No, that's not my place. That is the government's place to do that. They are ordained by God for that purpose. And so because of that, the Bible says that we are not to revile the gods. You know, the Bible talks about in 2 Peter chapter number 2 and Jude chapter number 1, when speaking about false prophets, says that those false prophets are self-willed, presumptuous, and they hate governments. Why do they hate governments? Because they don't want anybody ruling over them. They don't want anybody to have any authority over them. And listen, isn't that why sometimes you see young kids that grow up and they just rebel against mom and dad because they don't want mom and dad ruling over them. They don't want mom and dad having authority over them. So I'm going to go join the military because mom and dad, I can't stand them ruling over me. So I'm going to have a drill sergeant yell at me. Does that make a whole lot of sense? 
Now, listen, I'm not saying uh, that everybody joins the military because of that, but there are certainly men out there who have done it because of that reason. And listen, that is the wrong reason to do so. Why? Because they're hating that God-given authority that is ruling over them, and you are actually breaking this commandment that's in the Bible when it says, Thou shalt not revile the gods. Because that term there is not being used for a higher power. That is a term that's being used for a man. For somebody that is in authority over you. That's why it says, is it not written that ye are called gods? Now take your Bibles, go ahead and go to Psalm chapter number 82. And look at what the Bible has to say there. Psalm chapter number 82. Now why would the Bible use this term and call men gods you know we understand what it's talking about that it's saying that they're rulers why would it use that term for men because what does a ruler do doesn't he rule and in order to rule what does he have to do he has to make judgments doesn't he look at what the bible says here psalms chapter number 82 and look down to verse number one and the bible says this in psalms 82 Verse number one, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge? What's it say? Unjustly. And accept the persons of the wicked. Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now, what is God telling us in that chapter when he says, ye are gods? This is the chapter that Jesus is quoting from in the New Testament and what is this chapter telling us to do what's he saying why are you judging unjustly that's what he's saying why aren't you judging rightly and in essence when he's telling you to judge rightly what's he telling you to do to judge right but don't we live in a world today that doesn't want to judge anybody That doesn't want to judge anything. Their most famous passage, and we'll talk about this passage in a little while, but their most famous passage that they want to quote all the time, they can only quote two words out of the entire passage, and what is that? Judge not, judge not, lest ye be judged. That's the only part of that that they know. But what does the Bible actually teach us? That we ought to make judgments because what does God call men in this world? He calls them a God for that purpose that they are to make judgments in the earth. And again, it's not calling you a God in the sense that we call God God. Right? He is the supreme lawgiver. He is the only lawgiver. But we can make judgments in this world based upon what God has already said. And we are to judge rightly and righteously because God has told us to. But the world out there doesn't want anybody to judge anybody, right? I mean, they'll tell you, well, because we're all sinners, you can't judge me and I can't judge you. Because after all, all sin is equal. All sin is the same. And that is one of the biggest lies on this earth. Not all sin is the same. Sin is not equal. It's not all the same. I mean, if you think that your child stealing a piece of candy is the same as a pedophile molesting a child, you've got a problem in your brain because those sins are not the same. That's why they carry a different penalty, don't they? I mean, the child, what is the penalty for his sin? A slap on the hand? Maybe a pat on the rear end. You know, that might be his punishment, but what's the punishment for the child molester? The death penalty is what it ought to be for that person. Those sins are not the same, and we can sit there and judge them because God has said so in his word, and his judgment is already laid out. And notice there, it says in that chapter, why do you judge unjustly? Look back at it again, read it. Look at what it said there in verse number Two, it said, how long will ye judge? What's that? Unjustly. You see, it's impossible to judge. 
You're either going to judge rightly or you're going to judge unjustly. I mean, listen, every one of you, the first time that you come to this church, this church, guess what you do? You judge people, don't you? I mean, you come to church, you hear the preaching, you hear the pastor, and guess who you judge? The pastor. And listen, you ought to do so, and you know what you're doing? You're judging the pastor and you're judging the preaching to see if this is a place where I want to bring my family. Is this a church that I can come to? Is he teaching the word of God? You are judging that rightly. And you know what? When you sit in the congregation, you see other people and you meet other people, you are judging them as well based on what you see, your intuition, the words that they say, the things you see them do. And you know what? All of us ought to make judgments. You know what the problem is? Most people out there, they just judge unjustly. They judge in hypocrisy, and they don't judge rightly according to the Word of God. Now look back down to what the Bible says. In fact, take your Bibles, go ahead and go to Revelation chapter number 1, and look at verse number 6. Revelation chapter number 1, look at verse number 6, and look at what the Bible has to say there. Revelation chapter number 1, and look at verse number 6. Now did you notice back in that chapter in the book of Psalms, it said, All of you are the children of the Most High. Now, in that chapter, who's that actually speaking to then? People who are saved. People who are believers. Because here's the thing. Not everybody is a son of God. Not everybody is a child of God. How do you become a child of God? Well, the Bible tells us in John, in the book of John, chapter 1, verse number 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. So it is those that believe that become the sons of God. So in the book of Psalms, who are we actually talking to? We're talking to the saved is who we're talking about. Look at Revelation chapter number 1 and look down at what the Bible has to say. Revelation chapter number 1 and look down to verse number 6. Look what the Bible says there. And notice what it says. And hath made, who's this? What's that word? Us. Now, who's the us? The saved. Believers, right? Look what it says. And hath made us what? Kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So God has made us kings. Now, what does that mean that God has made us kings? Does that mean that we're just uh, royalty and we get to go around and just act like we're better than everybody else because we're royalty? Is that what it's talking about? No, what is the purpose of a king? Well, the purpose of a king is that he was a ruler and that he was to make judgments so if god has made us kings unto god well then what is that saying about us that he has made us that we are to make judgments in this world and by the way the day and time is coming when we will live and reign with the lord jesus christ and guess what we're going to make when we're on this earth with jesus christ we're going to be making judgments. And so anybody that tells you that you cannot judge anything in this world is a fool. Because you know what? You ought to make judgments. You ought to judge people whether they are safe for your children to be around them, them or not. Don't you judge other kids and judge whether that kid is the right kind of kid that your kid can hang around or not? Absolutely. Listen, that is a right judgment as a parent you are to make those kinds of judgments but don't be surprised if you sit there and make that judgment and then the other parent doesn't like that and they say well you better than me i mean i'm a sinner like you after all so therefore you can't judge me isn't that the theory the philosophy of the world that's exactly what they say but you know what we can make right judgments according to the bible why because god has made us kings and priests unto god take your bibles go ahead and go to revelation 5 look what it says there revelation chapter number 5 look at verse number 10 it says something similar it says in revelation 5 verse number 10 it says and has made us unto our god kings and priests and we shall do what reign on where the earth now if we're reigning on the earth what does that mean that we're going to make judgments is what that means take your bibles go to first corinthians chapter number four and look at what the bible says there first corinthians chapter number four and look down at verse number eight first corinthians four verse number eight the bible says this 
Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. Now, if we're not supposed to make judgments, then why there, three times in the same verse, does it talk about the people of God reigning here on this earth? You know why it says that? Because we are to make judgments, and that is the point that Jesus is trying to get across to them in John chapter number 10, when he tells them, ye are God, that they can make judgments. But here's the thing, when you make those judgments, they need to be right judgments. And they don't need to be according to your humanistic philosophy and according to what you think is right and according to what your heart says is right because the heart is deceitfully wicked and who can know it, the Bible says. When you make those judgments, it ought to be according to the Word of God. And that's why in John chapter number 10, we'll go back in a little while, but in John chapter number 10, he goes on to tell them, if you believe me not, believe me for what? For the works. You believe me because I do the works of whom? The Father. What's he telling them? You can judge me according to the word of God because I'm doing the works of the Father that are written in the word of God. And therefore they can judge whether Jesus is actually God or not. They could judge whether Jesus was the Messiah or not, whether he was the Savior or not, because of what? Because of the works that Jesus Christ did while he was here on this earth. Now take your Bibles, go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 3, and look at what the Bible has to say there. Let me give you a few things here today that you ought to make judgments in. And people that are in these places ought to take these places to be the rulers to make those judgments. Look what the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, and look at verse number 5. And the Bible says this in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 5. And this here is talking about the qualifications of a pastor, but look at one of, what one of the qualifications is. Look what it says. For if a man know not how to do what? Rule his what? His own House. Now, while these are qualifications for a pastor, these are things you have to meet in order to be a pastor. These are not just for the pastor. These are things that every Christian ought to strive for, that every man or husband of a, or a leader of a home ought to be striving for these things. And you men ought to, ought to be the ruler of your home. The Bible says, is it not written that ye are gods? You know why that's written? Because you are to make judgments within your household. You're the one to be leading and guiding your house, leading and guiding your wife. Today, we've got it the other way around in our society, don't we? Where our society today, it's the women that leads the home. And that's why you go into the majority of churches out there. And you know who you see in church on Sunday morning? You don't see a room full of men like you see here this morning where you've got men and women. You know what you see in most churches out there? You see a bunch of women at church and there's no men in the church. Why? Because the men have stepped down and are not taking the leadership role that they ought to take in their own families. You know, the man ought to be the one that steps up and makes that judgment and says, this is where we're going to go to church. That's the man's judgment. That's the man's place to rule in his house because he has been given that authority by God. Now look, ladies, if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but that's what the Bible teaches. That's what God says in his word, that the ladies are to be in subjection unto their own husbands. Now listen, men, I'm not saying that you sit there and just be a lord over your wife. And that you just beat her into submission or anything like that. But at the same time, you've got to take the initiative to be the leader in your home where you say, this is what we're going to do. This is right. And here's where it says it in his word. And because this is what God says, then this is what we are going to do. You see, you make that right judgment for your home because God has told you to in his word. You ought to make that judgment. You ought to make the judgment and leave the house and tell them, hey, every single night, we're going to have family devotions. We're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to read the Bible as a family and read it together and discuss the things that are in the Word of God and pray together as a family. This is what we are going to do in our home. 
You know, I made the decision a long time ago before I was ever a pastor that I would always be in the house of God. That there was nothing that would take me out of the house of God. That, you know what, if it was all possible within my power, I would not be working on Sundays. You know why? Because I want to honor God and that job will be there tomorrow. And by the way, in case you think that an employer can force you to work on Sundays, it's actually against the law in the United States of America for them to do so. Do y'all know that? They cannot force you to do so. It's against the law. They have to give you that off on Sunday. If you say, you know what, I cannot work on Sunday, they have to give you that day off. Now listen, I understand every once in a while there's an employer that's a good employer, and you know what, Uh, they've been good with you, and they've worked with you, and you try to help them out and so forth, but you know what, that employer cannot force you to work on Sunday, and you know what you ought to do when you go into that work, and you go look for that job, you ought to tell them right up front, hey, I can't work Sundays. You know what? Because you need to be honest with them and you need to tell them what you ought to do and you need to make that judgment for yourself and for your family. Why? Because the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So the Bible tells us that we ought to be in the house of God when the doors are open. We ought to be there Sunday morning. We ought to be there Sunday night. We ought to be there on Wednesday night. If it's within our, within our hands, we need to make that decision for our families. Because you know what? The ladies don't need to be the ones making that decision. You know what? Those ladies, you know what they want to do? They want to follow a strong man. They're looking for a man that wants to be a strong man, that wants to be a leader, that's going to provide for their families, that's going to take care of their families, that's going to lead them and guide them in their, in their lives. You know what? They'll be way happier when they're in their natural role of just loving the husband and leading and guiding the house and their husband being the one that's ruling over the home. That's where the husband needs to be instead of allowing the wife to do it while he's sitting on the couch eating potato chips off of his chest watching his favorite sitcom at all hours of the night instead of spending time with his family. You know what? You ought to spend some time with your family and get into the Word of God. And you know what? Serve God together. Get them working with you. Take them sowing with you. You know why I got saved at the age of five years old and why I could understand the gospel that young? Not because of me or how smart I was, but because my dad was a soul owner. And because my dad took me out with him uh, week after week, day after day, knocking on doors and giving people the gospel. And guess what? By the time I was five years old, I had heard the gospel thousands of times. And you know what? When you've heard the gospel thousands of times, those little minds, they soak things in. They take things in. They learn more than you think they do. And you know what ends up happening? That child will end up getting saved. Why? Because they've heard the gospel thousands and thousands of times. Now take your Bibles here this morning. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. And look at what the Bible says there. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Look down at what the Bible has to say. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Look at verse number 17. And the Bible says there. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 verse 17. Notice what it says. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in what? Word and doctrine. Now here, who's the elder it's talking about? It's talking about the pastor, right? The the pastor ought to be one that's leading the house of God. And by the way, that can only be a man. You go to a church where there is a woman who is a pastor who gets up on the stage or gets up there and preaches and teaches the Word of God, that church does not believe the Bible. Because what does the Bible say? Number one, it says women are to be silent in the church house. That's what the Bible says. And number two, one of the qualifications of a pastor is that he is the husband of one wife. Now, can a woman be the husband of one wife? Not according to the Bible, maybe in this crazy, whacked out world that we live in today, but not according to the word of God. And so what do we see in the word of God? That the pastor ought to be a man who is leading and guiding the house of God. And guess what? In order to be a pastor, don't I have to make judgments? Yes, but you know what we have in this world? We have a lot of pastors out there who don't actually want to be a pastor who just want to be liked by everybody. They just want to be a public figure. They want to be everybody's best buddy and everybody's best friend. And listen, I'm not here to be your best friend. Now listen, if you end up being my best friend, great. 
You know, I love having friends, and I believe most people in this church probably are. My friends, that's a great benefit that I get of that. But you know what? I'm not here to be your buddy. You know what I'm here for? To teach you the Word of God. You see, the problem is when you get a pastor who just wants to be everybody's buddy, then he doesn't teach the entire Word of God. Because there are things in this Bible that are not popular with society. You think it's popular with society to stand up and say women would be silent in the church house? You think that's popular? But you know what? That's what the Bible says. And my job is to do what? To teach you and to preach to you what the Bible has to say. But we've got too many pastors out there that just want to be buddy-buddy instead of making right judgments. They're judging unjustly. Now take your Bibles, let's move off from that. Go to Matthew chapter number 5, and look at what Jesus had to say there. Matthew chapter number 5, or Matthew 7 rather. Matthew chapter number 7. Now this is the chapter that they like to quote all the time in the world where, they're, where they will only quote the two first words, which is what? Judge not. And they'll say, you can't judge me because the Bible says, judge not. Let's look at what the Bible's saying. The Bible says this, Matthew chapter number 7, and look down at what it says in verse number 1. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now first off, what's the Bible saying here? How you judge other people is how they're going to judge you. So you know what? I need to make sure that I am judging rightly and righteously then i'm not taking my judgment beyond what is biblical and taking my judgment beyond what is right in the word of god for example if a brother in christ makes a mistake and i judge him too harshly and i'm too hard on him because of what he's done well then what's going going to end up happening is then one day when i make a mistake then he's going to turn around and judge me as harshly as i judged him He's going to remember how I treated him, and he's going to treat me likewise. So that's what the Bible is teaching there, but look at what it goes on to say. The Bible says this in verse number 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, what is the Bible telling us there? It's teaching us not to judge in hypocrisy. That don't be a hypocrite and have this huge sin in your life and be sitting there with a major sin and then judging your brother for something small. You know what? You sit there and you don't go soul winning, but you judge your brother for not coming to church. Guess what you're doing? You're judging your brother with a big old beam in your eye called no soul winning. You sit there and don't go share the gospel with people, and you sit there and don't give the word of God to people like the Bible commands you to do, like Jesus told us to do. The very last thing that he said before he sent it up to, the, uh, to heaven was, Go ye therefore and to teach all nations. And we've been commanded by Christ to do that. But then you sit there and judge your brother for not coming to church on Wednesday night. Guess what you've done? You have been a hypocrite because you've got a major beam in your eye. Listen, I would rather you go soul winning than come to church on Wednesday nights. Now listen, here's the thing. Do both, right? Come to church on Wednesday nights and go soul in. But you know what? Which one is more important? The soul in is more important than coming to church on Wednesday. But you know what? They're both important. But one is more so than the other. So don't sit there with a major beam in your eye judging in hypocrisy. That's what the Bible is saying. Don't be a hypocrite. Now look down where the Bible goes on to say verse number 6. This is not a coincidence that this verse comes next. Look at what it says. Give not that which is holy unto whom? Now, who thinks here he's actually talking about actual dogs? Okay, if he's not talking about actual dogs, then who's he talking about? He's talking about people, right? He's saying that there are certain types of people that Jesus himself called dogs. There are certain types of people in the Bible that the Bible specifically calls 
dogs. And one of those you can find in the Old Testament is sodomites. That queers are called dogs in the Word of God. Then you also find throughout the Bible that false prophets are called brute beasts and called dogs. And then you've also got the Jews, which are also called that as well. Why? Because they were false prophets and they were antichrist because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and they forbid men to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so notice what he says there and what he tells us to do. Look at verse number six. Give not that which is holy unto who? The dogs, neither cash ye your pearls before swine. Why? Why should we not do that? Look what it says lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So in order to fulfill that verse, don't we have to be able to make judgments? Yeah, because I have to be able to tell who a dog is. I have to be able to tell who the swine is according to the Word of God. And what this is talking about is some of the most despicable people out there who have rejected God, that are reprobate, that want nothing to do with the Lord, that want nothing to do with God, that if you go try to give that person the gospel, try to give them that which is holy, they will turn again, they'll trample it under their feet, and they will turn again and rend you. They will turn again and they will bring harm physically upon your person. And listen, are there people out there like that? Absolutely. And listen, that's why when we go soul in, we're not looking to get into arguments with people. We're not looking to sit there and to just try to prove our point to people when we knock on people's doors, when we give them the gospel. You know what we're doing? We're looking for people that are interested. And if they're interested and they want to hear what we have to tell them, then we give them the gospel. But if they're not interested, we don't stand there and try to argue with them. You know why? Because it's for your own safety. Because if you do, that might be one of those people that turns again and rends you. You sit there and stick your foot in that door and keep them from shutting the door. Well, there might be a double-barreled shotgun coming your direction. Because you know what, if you did that at my house trying to force me to listen to you, and you st- stuck your foot in my door, guess what's coming off my hip? My Glock 45 is coming off my hip, and you're going to remove your foot quickly from my door. Well, how much more so when it's somebody who is not holy, who the Bible calls a dog, who the Bible calls swine, that's a wicked person, how much more so are they going to hate you because of what you're coming to do? Because you're trying to give them the gospel. That's why we have to be able to make those judgments. We have to be able to tell who's a dog and who's not. We have to be able to tell who's the swine and who's not. And listen, not everybody out there is a dog. And just because somebody says no at the door doesn't mean they're a dog. And doesn't mean that they are a reprobate. They might need to hear the gospel another time later on because some sow, some water, but God give the increase. Not everybody gets saved the first time they hear the gospel. It might take a few times for them to hear it before they actually get saved. But at the same time, when somebody doesn't want to hear the gospel, then we're not looking to argue with them. We're going to move on, and that's why this is in this chapter, because you know what Christ is trying to teach us? To judge rightly, because ye are called gods in the Scripture, not God like him, little g God, as in a ruler, somebody that makes judgments in this world. Take your Bibles, we're almost done here this morning, go to Luke chapter number 12, and look at what the Bible says there. Luke chapter number 12, look down at verse number 57, Luke chapter number 12. And look down at verse number 57 when you get over there. Luke chapter number 12. And look down at verse number 57. Look what the Bible has to say. Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 57. And the Bible says this in the book of Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 57. Notice what it says there. It says this. Yea, and why even of yourselves, notice this, judge ye not what is right. So what's the Bible asking us? Why are you not judging? You see, the world tells you, don't judge. But what does God actually tell you? Why are you not judging? Why are you still judging unjustly? How come you don't judge? Look what it goes on to say, verse 58. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge uh, deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. Now, what's the Bible telling us there? We ought to judge ourselves. 
You know what? If you do something wrong, you ought to judge yourself and get it right before you're delivered up to the judge. Before somebody sues you at the law and takes you to the judge, you ought to be seeking to get something right already if you have done something wrong. But listen, when it comes between you and a brother in Christ, you know what? You should never take that brother in Christ to court. You should never sue a brother in Christ over things like that. Now listen, if they've done something criminal that's worthy of the death penalty, yeah, you deliver them up to the police. You give them over to the police and let the government deal with that. But if it's a matter between me and a brother where a brother has defrauded me, you know the Bible teaches that we should judge that among ourselves. You know, the Bible says you shouldn't even take that to the courts, that we ought to be able to bring that to the brethren and to be able to judge that ourselves and get that worked out ourselves within the house of God. Let me show it to you. Take your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and look at what the Bible says there. You know what? 1 Corinthians 6, that's where I want you to go. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, look at verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and look down at verse number 1, see what the Bible says there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And verse number 1, and the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 1, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before who? The unjust and not before the saints. Now why is it saying that? Listen, why would you rather be judged by somebody who's not saved? who's probably a fornicator, a drunkard, and an adulterer, do you really want to be judged by that person? Or would you rather be judged by somebody who's judging according to God's law? Who's going to give a fair judgment that can't be paid off, that can't be bought or sold like the judges we see out there in the world? Now, I'm sure there are some of those judges that might be decent guys, but you know what? A lot of them we see evidently are not. And why do we see that? Because how often do we see criminals that commit major crimes and they're just slapped on the wrist? I mean, they molest a child and yet they're not given the death penalty. They just have to go to the jail for a few years and then they're let out of jail on probation and then they go out and do it again. You know, if that judge was doing righteous judgment, that molester would be put to death. But then we have somebody that gets caught with drugs, gets caught with marijuana, and they throw the book at that guy. By the way, marijuana and drugs is not illegal according to God. Did you know that's not a criminal offense? And by the way, you know what? You sit there and think it ought to be a criminal offense. That's because you have been brainwashed by the world. And you know what? The government's war on drugs, if you haven't noticed, isn't working. It's not helping in the least. Just taking people and locking them up and throwing away the key is not helping those people. It's destroying those people and it's destroying their families. You take somebody who has a drug problem and you take them, throw the book at them, throw them into prison, throw them into jail, and now the guy loses his job. Now there's a family and children without a father in the home. And now the mother has to go out and get a job to provide for her children. And she's struggling to do so. So the children have to go to the public school system and are basically being raised by the public school system because dad's in jail and mom is working a job where she can't spend any time with her children. You have destroyed that family and you have destroyed those children's lives as they grow up you think our system is really working maybe we ought to have something that doesn't throw these people into prison because you know what it's not a criminal offense in the word of God and listen by the way if you're going to make marijuana a criminal offense why don't you make uh, drunkenness a criminal offense but last time I checked that's legal in the state of Louisiana that's why our insurance is so high because everybody here gets so drunk on alcohol and they go out and drive and end up hurting one another and killing one another out there on the roads because, hey, drunkenness is okay, just not marijuana. Isn't that a, a hypocrisy? And listen, I'm not advocating for taking drugs. I believe it's wrong. I believe as a child of God, you ought not to do that. But the answer is not making it a criminal offense. You know what the answer is? Teaching people the Word of God and showing them what the Word of God has to say. Look on down, what, look what the Bible goes on to say. Verse number two, do you not know that the saints, that's us, shall do what? Shall judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge your smallest matters? 
Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to what? This life. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But that's who you want to go be judged by out there. I mean, look at that list right there. That's the unjust. That's the unsaved. That if you go to law against a brother in Christ, guess who you're being judged by? That kind of a person. Now, if we're going to be judged by somebody, wouldn't you rather have a righteous person judge over you? Wouldn't you rather have somebody that's right with God and prayed up with God that understands and knows the laws of God to judge you? So when it comes to matters between brother and a brother of Christ that have defrauded one another, you know, you ought to be able to work that out in the house of God. You ought to be able to take that to another brother in Christ and have him judge between you. And listen, when that brother in Christ makes the judgment, you should honor that judgment. You should listen to that. But even if your brother in Christ does not and defraud you, the Bible says it is better for you to just be defrauded. It's better for you just to suffer loss because when you take it to the law, guess what? Then they look at you and they look at all these Christians and they call you a hypocrite. And they say, well, look at these Christians and look at how they're acting and look at how they're suing one another. Look at what they've done to one another. And you give those out in the world a reason and a cause to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. Now, again, if it's a matter that the government has rule over according to the word of God, yeah, let them deal with it. You know, if it's somebody who's a men stealer, kidnapper, deliver them up to the government. If it's a matter of rape, Murder, deliver them up to the government and let them deal with that. But with matters between brothers in Christ, you ought to be able to work that out together or just suffer wrong, suffer ought, defraudment yourself is what the Bible teaches. Now let's finish this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and look what the Bible says there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse number 14. And the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 14. Look at what the Bible says there. But the natural man, who's that? The unsaved person. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he, knows this, that is what? Spiritual judgeth what? All things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Now, who is the spiritual man? Well, the Bible says that the law of God is spiritual. You know what that means? A spiritual man knows the laws of God. A spiritual man, he's not a perfect man. He's a sinner just like you and I, but he's a man that knows the laws of God and has put the laws of God into his heart and into his mind. By the way, this doesn't have to be the pastor. This ought to be every single man that's a member of this church. That they ought to be able to judge between things. Why? Because it's not about who the man is. It's about who God is. And he's not judging according to his own word, but he's judging according to the law of God. You see why he's a spiritual man and he can judge all things? It's not because he's a sinner. It's because he's a spiritual man that has put the word of God in his heart and in his mind. And therefore he can judge all things because of what God has said. He can say, you are right and you are wrong because here's what the Word of God says. That's why we can make judgments in this world because we are the children of God. And the next time somebody tells you, well, how can you judge? Who are you to judge? Here's the answer, because I'm a son of God. Because I'm a child of God and because I can understand the Word of God because you know what? The unsaved can't understand this book. 
That's what the Bible just said. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. They are foolishness to them. You see, to the world, the things that are taught in this book, it's foolishness to them. They don't understand it. They can't make those right judgments. That's why they make these stupid, foolish judgments out there. That's why they sit there and they make the judgment of taking the molester and just letting him go, giving him a slap on the wrist. Meanwhile, throwing the book at the drug guy. Does that make much sense? No, that is foolishness. That is stupidity at its height, but that's a judgment that the world makes. And when they look at what we say and say, no, it ought to be the other way around, they'll say, well, that's foolishness. You know why? Because they don't understand the word of God. But because to them, that child molester is the same as everybody else. And you know what? That is coming in this world. You see, you see, you sit there and let them tell you right now that the queers are the same as everybody else, that they are just the same. They're no worse than you and I. I mean, they're people, we're people, we love people, they love people. Just let them love one another. And before long, in five years or ten years at the most, you'll be at the same point in time when it'll be the pedophiles that are coming completely out of the closet. And they're already starting to. And the world will be telling you you can't judge them they're made that way they're created that way they're born that way is what the world will tell you when the bible says put them to death when the bible says give them the death penalty and they'll look at you and call you crazy for believing the word of god don't they look at us and call us crazy for believing the word of god now i sit there and tell people according to the bible that the bible flat out says that sodomite should be put to death and the world looks at me and says you're crazy you know why they say that? Because they don't understand God. Because they don't have the Spirit of God. And they look at the world and they're judging unjustly. And you continue going down that path, America. You continue following that path. I promise you there will come a day and time that your children and my children will grow up and the pedophiles will have more rights than they do. That is where we are headed in this country. Why? Because Christians are too soft and too weak to stand up for the Word of God. And if they would preach what the Word of God says, imagine if you had 6,000 pastors saying what I'm saying here this morning in America. Maybe the queers would go back in the closet. Maybe the pedophiles would run and hide and not come out, but because Christians don't want to judge and they just want to be buddy-buddy with everybody that's in the world and they just want to be loved by the world, your children and my children will be the ones that are being judged by the pedophiles and the pedophiles will be the ones putting them to death when they deserve the death penalty. That's where our country is headed because Christians don't want to judge. Because they don't want to make judgments and they just want to love the world. Well, I got a verse for you this morning. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what your Bible says this morning. That if you sit there and you love the world like that, then the Bible says the love of the Father is not in you. You know why? Because you're not judging righteous judgment. You're not judging like Jesus Christ would judge. A lot of people say, well, do what Jesus would do. WWJD, what would Jesus do? You ought to act like Jesus Christ. Do you realize Jesus judged? Do you realize Jesus called people vipers? Do you realize Jesus Christ called people snakes? Called people the children of the devil? Called people dogs? Called people swine? Made judgments and said that would be better for the pedophile uh, to tie a millstone about his neck and to be cast into the ocean in the face of the wrath of God. That's what Jesus said about the pedophile. Jesus said, here's how you ought to put him to death. Put a millstone about his neck and cast him into the ocean. He said it would be better for him to do that than to face me. Because you know what? Jesus Christ is God. And he said it would be better for that pedophile to do that and to die that horrible death where he's being sunk down in the ocean and he is suffocating to death with a millstone dragging him down by his neck, twisting around his neck, pulling him down into the ocean, eventually being crushed by the weight of the water. It would be better for him to face that death than to face the wrath of God. That's what God says about those kinds of people. And when you sit there and bow up like that, you know what you've just done? You've judged unrighteously. 
because you have said your judgment is better than the judgment of God. Listen, I don't care what your judgment is. You know who I care about? I care about God's judgment. And we can judge here this morning because Jesus said, is it not written, you are God's. What was he saying? Judge rightly. Judge righteously. You can make judgments in this earth. Let's end in a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've given to us this morning. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to take these things. To search them out, to study them out, Father. We thank you for your word, and we just ask that you be with us this week. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're dismissed here this morning.